All right. We're going to learn how to make an electronic circuit breaker. Now, we use this anytime that we're experimenting with something that can pull a lot of current suddenly out of control. Like if we're building power supply and if it shorts out it could um, you know, short the line completely. If you don't have a circuit breaker then your house breaker is all you've got. Now you could make up a little box with a, a little hand circuit breaker in it, just a, a plain push button one. That would work. But uh, we're going to make one that's even fancier. We're going to set it to where we have the current itself variable and we have the number of cycles of AC that it allows the current before it blows. This will go ahead and allow for surge currents. You don't want it to trip when you have surge current and yet if you have too much current you want it to trip quick. And I found that even fast acting circuit breakers don't trip very fast. They'll usually be uh, a, a, a pretty good delay several cycles before they pop. So we have this one we can set it anywhere from two cycles to 32 cycles. That's from uh, about um, 30 milliseconds to about a half a second we can have a delay. Okay, that'll allow for any kind of surge that you might have. If you have, you have a big motor you're testing, it'll uh, go ahead and allow for that motor to start. If you have a transformer with a big core, it'll let that, let that iron charge up without blowing it. Okay, how does it work? Okay, the first thing we have is our main circuit here. The heavy wire is shown and that is how the main power gets through to the outlet. Okay, we have a relay, a 15 amp relay, and we connect up both sets of contacts on it. This one just happened to be a double pole. You can use a single pole if you have a single pole, but a double pole makes it to where you split the current between two sets of contacts. Have a little bit less um, wear on the contacts if you have big, huge uh, circuits being broken. Now, we want to have some way of measuring the current. So uh, we go ahead and we use a current transformer. Now what a current transformer is, is it's simply a high ratio transformer so that a small amount of uh, turns on the primary will generate quite a bit of voltage on the secondary. So we can have oh, maybe uh, less than a volt drop on the primary so we don't have any effect on the uh, circuit and yet on the output we'll have several volts so that our electronics has some, some working room. Uh, it, it's a lot easier to make a trigger circuit for 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 volts rather than 30 millivolts, 40 millivolts, 50 millivolts, you know, that low voltage like that where even the smallest spikes can cause trouble. All right, so what we do is we use a current transformer. So um, we have us a 15 amp standard old push button breaker on the thing. Now that's our safety breaker. We put that in there in case we have a failure. We, we want to have it to where if we have a failure, we're going to go ahead and pop the circuit with our safety breaker. Okay, we always do that. Safety is uh, very important. Okay, we're going to use a, uh, to, to measure our current voltage, wattage, and all that, we're going to use a little digital amp meter. We can get it on eBay for $15. And this is a little unit like this. It has uh, the uh, voltage right here. We have the wattage on the output load. We have the kilowatts used. It'll sit there if you run it for some time. It'll go ahead and calculate how many kilowatt hours are used. And then we have the ampere reading, the volts and amps. Okay, this is $15. There, there, there's simply no way you can beat it for what it does. It comes with a little current transformer already with it. Okay, we'll use that to go ahead and um, be our monitor for what's happening uh, to our load. Okay, now, uh, our current transformer output voltage is going to be fed through a filter. We need a filter so that a spike current 
when we turn something on, there will be a spike. That will usually be well over any trip current that there would be. You know, it might be a spike that's a half a cycle that is uh, as much as uh, maybe 50 amps even if there's capacitive input to the circuit. So uh, we want to have a, uh, a little filter here so that spikes are completely eliminated. And we use a, 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 a couple capacitors and resistors to do that. And we feed the output of that into a comparator, which is our basic detector of the voltage level that we're going to uh, trigger. So we're going to set the uh, current transformers so that we have 0 to oh, 5 volts or 8 volts or 10 volts with a current from 0 to 15 amps. Okay, we'll do that by adjusting the number of turns. Okay, so we'll have our trip current adjustment and we'll use it to go ahead and set the reference on the comparator. So if you're below the trip point, nothing happens. Power stays applied. If, we, if the half cycles go above the trip current, where we have it set, if the voltage is high enough to trigger the 311, we start counting cycles. We have a 40-40 counter and each time that we um, exceed the trip current with a half cycle it goes ahead and gives a clock pulse and it starts counting that counter. We get, get two cycles, we get this one high, four cycles, eight cycles, it's a straight binary counter. And um, so with two cycles it would be um, two times 18 milliseconds which is at 60 cycles, 60 hertz and that would be um, around 36 uh, milliseconds to open the uh, circuit. That's very fast, extremely fast. It's as fast as a quick blow fuse. Okay, four cycles would give you um, um, about 72 milliseconds. Eight cycles, 150 milliseconds or so. Uh, 16, somewhere around 300, and 32 would be a half a, cycle, half a second. 60 cycles, 30 cycles would be half a second, so 32 is just a little bit over um, a half a second. So by selecting one of those taps, we can go from from about um, 30 milliseconds to about um, 500 milliseconds. Okay? That gives us our how long we're going to wait before we open the circuit when we go above the, uh, the, the set current. Okay? Let's look at each circuit by itself. We'll see what, what we have. Okay, here we have the basic input circuit. We have our high current going through the core. We use like one turn, maybe two turns, depends on the, uh, the, the uh, number of turns on the secondary. And we'll adjust that so that when we have 15 amps, which is the maximum this circuit is made to, to handle, uh, the breaker in, in, in my uh, uh, shop is, is 20 amp, the 20 amp breaker. Uh, so we don't want that to ever blow, the, the main uh, building breaker. So we're going to set this to where our maximum current we can get is 15 amps. If it goes above 15 amps, we're going to break the circuit here rather than having to go run out to the main house breaker. Okay, so we, we take our output voltage here which will be on the order of um, 0 to about 8 volts in this particular case. The, this happened to be uh, how it turned out with a toroid that I used. And we put a 10 microfarad capacitor directly across it. Now that significantly absorbs spikes. When, when you have that turn on spike, then it will try to invo induce hundreds of volts in this winding. This capacitor will absorb that and it'll just give a, a kind of a little uh, ripple, and that's it. And then we'll go ahead and feed it through a uh, resistor and another capacitor, and that'll cut out anything else. So in the end, if we looked at just what we get out of this circuit here, with current going through it, we'll have a sine wave that will give several volts with 15 amps in that wire that goes through the center of the core. Okay, that's how we detect our current. Okay, we'll have very little voltage drop here. If we used a resistor, even a 10th ohm resistor with 15 amps, we would have to have a huge power resistor. And that, that would be uh, a, a big waste of heat um, 
Not only that, we would have no isolation between our line and our circuit. And we, we want to have our circuit that we have isolated from the power line, just for good design practice. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it could be all hot, but uh, and we just insulate everything carefully in the box. But by isolating it, we put an extra level of safety in there to where if something gets connected to the cabinet or something, we're not going to have hot, hot voltage there. All right, let's look at our comparator. Okay, we have a 311, an LM 311. It's a national comparator. Um, we're going to hook it up so that it's non-inverting. So when when we have a certain amount of uh, uh, voltage set on our input, we're going to have zero volts here, and our input level will be set at some voltage set by our our trip voltage potentiometer, which will be on the front panel. And we'll have that calibrated in amps. So let's say that uh, one amp is one volt. We'll have this set at one volt. And then whenever this these peaks just barely break one volt, then we'll get the positive input will exceed the set point and our output is going to give us a pulse, just like we see right here. Each time it gets barely breaks it, it'll go ahead and give a pulse. And of course, if it goes way above it, we, we continue getting, getting pulses. But if we're anything below, we get no pulses. So this is how we detect the level of the um, current that we want to detect. Because we, we'll adjust this by using these two resistors. We'll adjust the range of our set voltage potentiometer to go from zero up to um, uh, 15 amps. All right, now let's look at our cycle counter. All right, we have a 4040. Hmm, I didn't write that on there. Okay, 4040 counter. It's just a ripple counter. And we have divide by 2, divide by 4, divide by 8, 16, and 32. It's just our outputs of the counter. It's a string of counters in there. We have a clock and we have a reset. Now, we take our output from our comparator, which is our pulses from here, and we put them to the clock. So each time we get a pulse, we step that counter one count. When we get two, if, we're, if we have this set to two, if we get two cycles that are above that uh, threshold, it'll go ahead and activate the FET and it'll pull in the relay and, and that'll break the, break the main power circuit. Okay? Now, when that relay, when, when, when that output is activated, this particular, this FET will go to ground. It'll go to zero volts. Okay, this, this will go high, and that will turn on the FET, and the, the collector, the, the drain, will go to zero volts. Now, when that goes to zero, okay, that allows current to flow through the relay and activates the relay and kills the circuit. It also, through this diode, it clamps the clock so that we don't get any more pulses. So as soon as it triggers, it locks the clock and it stays off. It has to stay off until we press the reset button. We have a reset button so that um, we can uh, keep the circuit shut down until we're ready to turn it back on again. If we didn't kill the clock, then it would count through and it would turn on again and then off again and it would just keep cycling like that and be a, a you know, just a, a real mess. Okay. So, on the uh, clock input, we'll get our clock pulses. On our single cycle, which we don't use, we're, we're not making it to where we just have one pulse and then shut off. Uh, we could do that, but I found that when we use one pulse, it triggers falsely. Uh, you know, if you have just you know, a little bit of a surge or something, gives you one pulse, it'll go ahead and shut it down. And that, that was too much of a nuisance. Very seldom do you get two pulses of a surge. So um, by going with two pulses, four, eight, instead of one, two, four, eight, it goes ahead and um, makes it to where there's fewer false triggers. All right. Then we get on to our second stage, and it takes two pulses. And then divide by uh, four would take four pulses, and right on down the line, and when the uh, when the pr appropriate output, this one here, we got it set to four, 
when that goes high on that uh, gate, that turns on the FET, that activates the relay, and locks the clock to ground. And from then on, the other outputs won't change because we have no more clock pul pulses until we press the uh, on button. Okay? So this is how, this switch here is how we uh, set the number of cycles that we're going to um, count before we go ahead and, and kill the current. Okay, so that's how the basic circuit works. Okay, here we have, we have the whole circuit and we can see that we have uh, to supply power we have a, 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 a small wall wart transformer. Uh, I just took a, took a uh, one of these little bitty wall warts. You know, it's, it, it was made for charging a toothbrush or something. And I just pulled the transformer out of it and used that for supplying the, uh, the voltage. It just happened to be a 24 volt center tapped. And you could use a, um, uh, any kind of a transformer that has a 24 volt center tap. You want plus and minus 12 volts because we, we need that, that negative voltage for that 311. Uh, we can run it on zero volts. However, it's best to go ahead and use a negative voltage on the uh, comparator so that the negative cycles from the input don't cause the uh, output to uh, enter a, uh, a forbidden state. It, it, it turns out that some of these comparators, when the, when the uh, input goes more negative than the negative power supply, it'll cause the internal guts of the circuit to malfunction and the output could go high. Uh, I don't know that a 311 will do that. I haven't ever tried it, but it's best to have that negative voltage on pin 4 that will always be more negative than the most negative uh, input that you'll ever have. You'll never have a failure if, if you do that. Okay, and then um, our reset button is on the front panel and that's used to go ahead and turn the power on. Anytime you press the the power, it turns all the outputs to zero, and that makes sure that your relay is uh, off, and the off condition is normally closed, which applies power. Okay, and that, that's the basic circuit. We have a 78L12, uh, which gives us regulated um, 12 volts, so that we, we want a regulated 12 volts for our uh, set trip current, so that um, the voltage on our potentiometer doesn't vary. Um, you know, there could be a little bit of variation in a line voltage if we have a big load on this thing, and that could cause our trip point to change around if we don't have a regulated voltage. Now, the negative supply, we just run straight to the uh, straight to the rectifier. We don't need to regulate that because the 311 is immune to changes on the negative voltage, and we don't use the negative voltage any place else in the circuit. And uh, so that that gives us our our basic power supply for the unit. Um, the relay, now this, this will be, depend on what relay that you have. Um, the output of this particular transformer um, is about 16 volts, eight, 16 to 17 volts, um, just, just for the raw voltage, just enough to run the 78 series regulator. And it also, if we used a 12 volt relay here, uh, it would be okay because the relay is only activated when the circuit trips. It's not continuously operated. It's only when the overcurrent occurs that the relay goes ahead and activates. So um, this can make it to where uh, we can use a 12 volt relay here. I just happen to have a 15 volt relay which will take continuous 15 volts off of here. So I use that, but if you have a 12 volt relay, you, it still would work okay. So if you can't find a, a 15 volt relay, or one of which will handle the output of your, your um, uh, raw voltage here. See, the, the raw voltage on here is going to depend on the transformer that you get. Ideally, you want a 24 volt center tapped. Um, they come in all different sizes, depends on what size of wall wart you use. If you get a little bitty wall wart, it may only have 100 milliamp capability, so this will load down if you have a relay that pulls 50 milliamps or 100 milliamps, it will load it down a little bit. So uh, you wouldn't have any trouble using a 12 volt relay. But if you've got a little hefty one, one that's a little bit bigger, 
this thing may maintain 16 volts on it when you put the relay load on it. So that could uh, overstress the coil in the relay. Now, normally, you'll go ahead and shut the power off if you blow it. If, if the thing pulls in and triggers, then you're going to want to go ahead and shut the power off and go ahead and find out what's wrong. Uh, otherwise, you just push the reset button and the relay opens anyway, and you don't have any power in it. So, uh, it's, it really just has to do with the, the relationship between your raw voltage here uh, and the relay that you have to, to determine uh, make sure your relay coil can handle whatever the raw voltage is out of your uh, uh, power supply. Um, it, it's, uh, the power supply is not really very important. It could be uh, 6 volts, um, plus and minus 6 volts, that would work. Then you set this voltage here to where it would be uh, 0 to 5 volts, so that you wouldn't exceed the power supply voltage to the 311. Um, you, you want the input voltage always to be within the power supply voltages. So if we have plus 12 volts here, which we have in here, this one could be as high as 12 volts on the uh, input, and a 311 would still work properly. Um, you, you'd probably need a little bit extra. It could go up to maybe 10 volts before it would start malfunctioning, but uh, you, you can get up pretty close to the power supply before it uh, goes crazy. So um, you would just go ahead, and if you have plus or minus 6 volts, you'd simply adjust this to where the output at 15 amps would be like 0 to 4 volts, which would be uh, enough to where you could have a good range of adjustment and yet uh, not exceed the ratings of 311. Okay, now, all of this stuff is pretty much easy to get. Wall warts, you can find wall warts all over the place. Uh, or you can buy the transformer, a 24 volt center tap, 250 milliamp transformer is about ten dollars. You can get it from Mouser or DigiKey, anywhere like that. Little small transformer. Uh, you just buy the darn thing and be done with it. Um, or you can take a wall wart and dismantle it. Take it, get a, a, a wall wart. Some of them have got plus and minus power supply uh, outputs. They're they're more rare. Most of the wall warts have only a single voltage output. That means you got to take the transformer and rewind it to have two windings. But not very fun. So it's best to go ahead and just get you a transformer that has got the center tap winding already. Now the, the thing that's uh, the most confusing here is this current transformer. What do we do about that? Now this meter here that we got from uh, eBay for $15, they got a transformer, current transformer that uh, comes with it. You, you get it. So this one here, current transformer here for the main uh, meter reading, you, you've got that already. Uh, now, the dirt, simple, cheap way of doing it, you buy two of these meters and you take the other uh, uh, core off of there and just use it there and you know, throw the meter away. Uh, but that's, that's you know, throwing $15 away is not, not that uh, uh, palatable of a of an action. So let's go ahead and see how we can make this transformer very easily. Okay, here we have the guts of a wall wart. This is a little bitty wall wart that was used to charge up. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was. It was some kind of a small uh, electronic device. I think it was a, a digital camera. And the output of the thing is, heaven only knows, I, I don't know, I think it's 6 volts. But um, it, it plugged into the wall and, um, you know, the output came out of it and that was it. Uh, okay, this one is a center tapped. So this transformer here actually would work for the power supply. It, it's, it's got a center tapped output. And it's not used in the same circuit as what we have here in this particular application. But it would work in, um, you know, for it. It's a little bit small, but it would work because there's no current. It depends on the relay you get. You want a relay that your transformer can handle. Get a big old fat relay there. It's a 15, 15 amp relay, so it's going to be pretty good size. Uh, it'd be, you know, hefty uh, if you want it to be reliable. 
Um, they make small ones. Um, they make some small ones that are yeah, a little bitty, but uh, I would rather have a nice industrial relay if you know, I'm going to be uh, betting my circuitry on it. Okay, so let's see how we can use this to make our current transformer. Okay, we have our primary and our secondary. Now we're going to use our 120 volt primary, which has lots and lots of turns, as the secondary. And then we're going to be using the primary, I mean the secondary, which has smaller numbers of turns. This, this one here has an output of about 6 volts. Uh, so we're going to use, use that the secondary as our, our current winding. Okay? Th this transformer is rated at 50 milliamps output. So clearly, we can't run 15 amps through that winding. And if we did, we would have 1,000 volts across the output. That would be completely ridiculous. So we have to strip off that winding so we can get our one turn, big heavy wire, to go through that core. Okay, to do that, the first thing we're going to do is get rid of this, this core. I mean, this uh, circuit board. So we'll get rid of that. Okay. Okay, and that leaves us just the... Uh, the terminal. So what I'm going to do next, we're going to take an X-Acto knife and we're going to get rid of this winding on here. We, we could dismantle it and then unwind it by hand and all that, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're just going to go in here and we're going to cut it. I'm just going to take it and I'm going to go. shove that through. See, we can get that wire out of there quite easily. Okay, we now have the secondary core area completely clear. And we see we have a hole through there that we can easily get a, a piece of heavy wire that will carry our 15 amps. You know, we'll need a piece of number, um, at least a piece of number um, 14 wire that we would use for um, carrying the 15 amps of uh, current in our circuit. Okay, we can easily get that through that hole. Right? We do not need these terminals, so I'm going to just go ahead and cut them off of there. Okay, and we get a result, a nice neat little transformer. Okay, but how do we tell how many volts we're going to get out of it for the 15 amps? Alright, let's go ahead and measure it. Okay, we're going to use this to measure our current. We can uh, use this to go ahead and be the reference. we got a load resistor and we got a variac. And one of the wires we're going to hook to our load resistor. This is 10 ohms at uh, 50 watts or something like that. Maybe 100 watts. I don't know what it is. It's a bunch. You need something about 10 ohms so that you can get uh, 15 amps through it 
without it burning out. Okay, we're going to go through our sensing, so this one will measure the current. Okay, now we're going to go through, first I'm going to try going through just once, and we'll see what we get. Okay, and then we connect this to our uh, load. Okay, so now <clears throat> we have the low voltage side of the variac connected to our load, and we have one of them. We, we have our uh, current sensor for this meter so that we can read our current that we're uh, putting through it. Let's see if I could get this to sit there. That should show up better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I got the variac over here, and I'll go ahead and vary that. All right, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn the scope on. And I'm going to connect it to the output of our little sensing transformer here. Okay, I've got the scope set to one volt per division. Okay. Get this set. What if I go this way? There we go. Now we go. Okay, I'm bringing the current out. I'm going to set the current to five amps. That's two, that's three. Four. Okay. Five amps. Woo! Okay. We're getting on uh, five times ten. That's five ten. We're getting fifteen volts on the output here with five amps. Okay. Let me go up to ten volts. Okay. Let me get this. Okay. That's. 20 volts per division, okay. Whoop. I got my, uh, I've got the uh, electronic breaker set here to 5 amps. Alright, let me set it to um, all right. 10 amps. How are we doing? Okay. Alright. We go to 10 amps now before it'll shut off. The electronic breaker is nice, you know, we, we, right then when we went past 5 amps, it shut the circuit off. Okay, at 10 amps, we've got, whew, got to shut that off, we were putting a lot of power into there. At 10 amps, we've got three divisions at 20 volts, at 60 volts we're getting on here. So even with one turn through the, uh, through the coil, I mean just going through halfway, we're getting an awful lot of current through here. So what we're going to have to do is, <clears throat> don't touch that, be smart, don't touch it, here, touch that. Right now, at, at 10 amps, we're reading uh, 60 volts peak. So in other words, this is 60 volts. Okay, that is way more than we need. So what we will do is we're going to... Uh, first, I need to put the 10 microfarad on there because that's going to change this somewhat. Um, let me get a 10 microfarad capacitor. I'm using a uh, tantalum capacitor here, a high, high quality sealed tantalum. All right, that's got our capacitor. Now we'll see if this changed it. It may not change it at all. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and raise the current again. 
can't see the camera. I'm being real good today and um, remembering you all in the camera. Okay, here we go. And not seeing anything. Okay. Yeah. Whew. Oh, that cut it a lot. Whoo, that cut it a bunch. Okay. <clears throat> What's happening here? The resistance of this winding is large compared to the reactance of this capacitor at 60, 60 hertz. So therefore it's loading the crap out of it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, see what we get. Okay, it's 5 amps and I'm getting a half a volt peak, okay? This went from 60 volts open circuit to a half a volt peak with 5 amps. That would be at 10 amps, that would be 1 volt, and at 15 amps it would be 1.5 volts. So this capacitor is going to be too much. We'll go ahead and we're going to change that from a 10 mic down to a, uh, a 1 mic. Since we have a lot of resistance here, we don't need this much capacitance. So what that does, it increases the reactance here by a factor of 10. We'll see if that's going to uh, get our voltage to be right. All right, we're ready to go again. Okay, we we'll set it, oh yeah, all right. Okay, at 5 amps, I'm reading a total of 1, 2, 3, 3 and 3 quarters volts at 5 amps. Okay, 3.75 volts at 5 amps. Okay, that's a little bit excessive because we go to 15, that'll be 15 amps. That would be three times as much, so that would be about almost 12 volts. Okay, that's going to be very close to our power supply on the 311. So let's go to a 2 microfarad here and we'll see what happens. Alright, 3 microfarads. Okay, let's go to 5 volts. 5 amps I mean. 2, 3, that's 4. Okay, 5 amps. We're getting 1.2 volts, okay? At, one, at 5 amps, we're getting 1.2 volts peak here. Okay, if we go to 10 amps, <laughs> shut down again. Let me put this up a little more. <laughs> the electronic breaker is a darn good breaker. It was set at around 9 amps. Okay, here we go. Two, two volts. Starting to smoke that. We're putting um, 10 amps through. That's 100 watts we're putting into that resistor. It's getting hot. Okay, so with the three microfarads across this particular one, we get 1.2 volts for each 5 amps of current. Okay, so that would give us <clears throat> uh, 0 to 3 volts for our required reference. Get this out of the top. We're going to have right here Remember the camera? Okay. Now, using that particular uh, uh, setup here, with three microfarads across the coil, right here, 
you have ground at zero, to the peak will be 1.2 volts for each 5 amps that we put through the uh, main wire, the primary. So for 15 amps, we're going to have 3.6 volts. This point here, these peaks, every other one, will be 3.6 volts at 15 amps. Okay? That means that this voltage here, to go from 0 to 15 amps, will, will make this voltage here go from 0 to 3.6 volts. Okay? We'll just adjust these resistors here to get that. Okay? That's a very nice range. And the power supply on the uh, 311 could be uh, plus and minus um, 6 volts, and that would be completely satisfactory. All right, so that's how that's how you would make the current transformer. Here we have one turn. We're just going through one time. We're not going all the way around. That would be two turns. We're going just through one turn through the core. Okay. Now that'll vary depending on the the, uh, the little transformer that you get. You know, this one here I think was a a, um, a 24 volt center tapped, but um, depending on what you get, if you get a 12 volt center tapped or whatever, that will determine um, what size capacitor that you'll put across it in order to um, get your voltage to be a um, to be a, a good value. You want to take that capacitor. And it just make it larger to cut the voltage, smaller to make the voltage higher. Okay, so that is the transformer that we will use for the uh, for the current uh, transformer right here. We'll have a single turn going right straight through. And we'll take these two, and that will be our output, and three microfarad across it. Okay. Now the next thing we've got to do is. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna lay out a <clears throat> lay out a nice little circuit board for this and make it to where we can you know make it pretty. Okay, we're laying out the circuit board for it. Uh, I use a uh, a simple little program called um, Copper Connection. Uh, it's what's known as a freehand program. Uh, you don't have to have any um, uh, Gerber files or, or input uh, source file or anything. You can just sit here and poke and lay and you know you can put the stuff anywhere you want. It, it's not structured in any way. Um, this is because I do all my circuit board making at home. I don't order them. Uh, this should not be used if you're going to order your circuit boards. You should use a structured program that that generates the um, the proper uh, Gerber files and stuff for you. Okay. The thing about a program like this is that it's quick and you can lay your stuff anywhere. It, it doesn't have forbidden areas or any of the other things that happen when you have the structured program. Because, because the structured program has to meet the <coughs> criteria that the manufacturers have for manufacturing the board. And it means you can't do certain things. You can't have, have things in certain areas. You can't have things too close together. There's all kinds of little gotchas that um, can make it to where your board will be non-manufacturable if you do it wrong. Therefore, you should not use a freestyle program like this if you're going to order your boards. <coughs>
we're not going to get there from here. I'm going to go all the way from right there to right there. We're not going to get there from here. So what we're going to have to do is use jumpers. That'll go right in there, no trouble. Okay, so our diode will go here, and then the jumper will go right there. We have no way to get around it um, on a single-sided board. Okay, it's okay. Okay, see this is no good here. We got a resistor going here. We got a capacitor. That thing's about that big around, so I got to move that down. <clears throat> Can't go, it's a rectifier right there, so I can't go any further down. Okay, that's it. That'll do it. That'll do it. The, the capacitor will be there and the resistor will fit around it. Okay. Let me squeeze it a little more. Okay, that gets everything. That gets everything. Okay, that's the whole circuit board. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and put it onto a piece of um, transparency. We use transparency. Now this will make a one-to-one -one print of the artwork that we can use in our printed circuit making stuff. When you make the artwork, you always use a uh, bubble jet printer. You know, don't use a laser printer. You won't get a the, the darkness of the black on a laser printer is not satisfactory for making the artwork. It'll, it'll over uh, expose the dark and what will happen is your, um, your, your lens will eat, they'll, they'll have slots and stuff eaten through them. You use an inkjet like this, it, you have no transparency at all on the darks. The black is absolute black. Okay, here we have our etching station. Okay, I've got a little piece of circuit board material with the positive um, uh, sensitive material on it. You can buy that online. And, um, you know, I always use the pre-sensitized stuff. I mean, you can get the stuff where you have to iron the, uh, the resist onto it and all, but you're going to have a lot worse results than if you buy the pre-sensitized stuff. You know, a board like this will cost you about two bucks. So, it's completely reasonable. Okay, we have our ultraviolet station here, vacuum frame. Now, one thing you want to watch out for when you put that artwork on that board, you've got, to, you've got two ways it can go. If you put it the wrong way, it's going to be mirror imaged. All right, we're going to let the ultraviolet light warm up. It takes about two, three minutes. Okay, we're going full power. Can you see how bright that sucker is? Woo! Potent stuff. Okay, we put that on there and we expose it for one minute. Okay, next we have to develop it. Alright, to develop it, you need your pan of some kind. This is just a baking pan. Um, Okay, our developing solution. There we go. I'm getting a little low on that. I'll have to mix some more. Got enough for this though. Okay, we just take our board, put it face up in it, and we just swish it. 
Don't know, it's hard to tell. Don't know if you can see. Eh, it ain't going to show up on the camera, but it's uh, just washing off all the extra resist, leaving the, the pattern. Okay, it's coming right off. Just takes a matter of seconds. In the winter time, if the temperature's like 70 or 60, then it'll take a little longer. But we're sitting at about 85 right now, so it, it develops really fast. Okay, and there's our developed board. Okay. The developing solution is very sensitive to air. As soon as you're through, put it right back in the bottle and seal it up. If, if it sits out for an hour or two, it'll ruin. There, there's volatile solvent that's mixed with it, and it'll evaporate. Okay, the next thing we do is we etch it. Okay, this is our etching tank. It's a glass tub. It holds about two gallons, maybe three gallons, of ferric chloride. It's a saturated ferric chloride solution. Now, ferric chloride eats all types of metal, so you have to make everything out of plastic. Our holder, our board holder, is made in, out of a block of plastic with a plastic bolt, plastic nut, plastic everything, because anything else will get eaten uh, by the ferric chloride. We clamp the board in the holder with the the etch side down. We want the we want the etch side to be down in the fluid, because the uh, the uh, material that comes off of it eaten is heavier than the liquid, so it settles off of there. Now you can put a, a bubbler in there that'll churn the liquid, make it etch very fast. This will take, uh, with no, no, uh, et, no uh, churning, takes about 15 minutes to etch at this temperature. Take about half hour if it's really cold out, like in winter time. But in the summertime here where we're 85 degrees, uh, it'll etch in uh, less than 15 minutes. Alright, we'll just let that sit in there and we'll come back in a little while and it'll be done. All right, we've been in here about 15 minutes, so let's see what we've got. All right. We got all itched. Okay, we'll go wash that off, and then we'll drill it and build it. Okay, this is the existing breaker, old analog meters, um, you know, Chinky looking panel, the whole thing. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna just remake this thing a little better. We'll save the box and we'll use um, the relay and some components off of here. Other than that, we're just gonna strip this and um, get rid of everything. Okay, our circuit board is our new circuit board, and it'll fit right there. Transformer will mount right here, two capacitors, and then the um, two ICs will mount on there and then we got our our terminals right here that'll be for the switch and all that will fit right in there just like it was. This will mount somewhere else. We'll figure something to do. Okay. And uh, our sensor transformer is this one here. That's going to mount right there. Okay. That's the one that we made. Okay, let's see, we'll clean the bench up a little bit and then we'll strip this down and we're going to drill our board and put it all together and we'll get, get after this thing. I've been doing a little work. Here's the new panel assembly. I took the other uh, unit apart, the old, um, the old dud one I took apart and um, got the parts off that I needed for here mounted the uh, digital meter and got a little piece of plastic to mount the uh, circuit board on and um, you know everything will fit in here pretty good. Alright the next thing that has to be done is drill the circuit board You can order the circuit board, but you're going to look at, oh, you know, a week to get it at the minimum. And usually if you have the one week delivery, it's going to cost you extra. 
but I like just making my boards at home for little simple projects like this. You know, if it's a real complicated project that needs a double-sided board, then you got to order it. But for a little simple single-sided board like this, we can get the whole thing made in, in an afternoon. We need a little bit of acetone. We have down to the last drop. I need a 4-pin socket and a 16-pin. I mean, 8-pin socket and a 16. Through-hole stuff. There's nothing wrong with through-hole stuff. If you've got plenty of room, through-hole is the way to go. Surface mount is good if you're uh, tight for space, but uh, you know if you're just making home projects, you don't want to make your stuff to where it's not repairable. And surface mount stuff is pretty much not repairable. Okay, this is our module. We got all the board, all the parts put on the board, and this is the. Uh, wiring on the uh, rest of it. I got most of it done there. The only thing that has to be done is hook the board up. <clears throat> okay. Holes here. The last one. Okay, I'm going to have one relay. Okay, now switch. A reset switch. Okay, now that takes care of a reset switch. Okay, now this one. the adjustment pot is the only thing we've got left. Okay, now these two are the line for the transformer. Now, that's got everything signal-wise connected up. Okay, now this is the uh, current. We've got it going through the first door right here. And we come up and we go through our homemade one here. Like that. Okay. And then we come down <coughs> and we go to the output. Okay. So that gets our main circuit all hooked up. Okay. We've got our current sense. Okay, now I'm going to put some knobs on here just for the heck of it. Okay. That's our current set, and this is the number of cycles. We'll, we'll label these in a minute. Alright, now we're ready to uh, juice it up and get it working. What we got to do, we've got these two resistors that set the range of the current. And since we have a different transformer now than we did before, the uh, sensing transformer, those values, they, they're not the same. They're not going to be the same. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to connect some potentiometers onto here so that we can adjust them and get, get a good, good start on where we're going to, going to have the setting. All right. Now, what we're going to do is set this up. For the correct current, what we've got to do is adjust the two resistors that are uh, feeding the power to the uh, trip voltage uh, potentiometer. Now, the first thing that we do is we look at the output. We look at the output of the uh, sensing circuit at, at given currents and we see how many volts peak that we get on the comparator. Okay, we'll turn the scope on. 
get ready here. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to look on the um, input to the 311. I've got everything set up here where we shouldn't have any short circuits. Because I'm working now with no electronic breaker. The electronic breaker I had is all dismantled. So we're working right off the line. Any shorts make a big bang. Plug it all in. Okay, now first I'm going to do, I'm going to set it to 5 amps. I'm just reading the current off the meter here. We're at 5 amps. I'm going to measure on the scope and we're reading 103 millivolts times 10 probes, so that's 1 volt, 1.03 volts. Okay, that's at 5 amps. Okay, now, what that means is that at 10 amps we will have 2 volts, and at 15 amps we'll have 3 volts. So what we've got to do is go on to the wiper of the adjustment pot that sets our trip voltage, and we have to set it to where when we adjust our control we're going to have an adjustment range of 0 to 3 volts. What you meowing about? <laughs> She's upset because it's really hot outside. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to the wiper and we're going to adjust our trim pots. Now, when we're all the way down, we're going to set it to amp and we're going to see what it takes to go ahead and trigger it. We want it to where when we're all the way counterclockwise, we're going to set it to 1 amp. Okay, we're right at 1 amp right now on our input. Okay. Reset it. Okay, we'll bring it down. Okay, we're too sensitive. Okay, so I'm going to bring that voltage up. We're going to adjust this particular resistor here. That sets the lower end. And we're going to, when, when the potentiometer, our adjustment is all the way down, that's going to be for our minimum current. We're going to set that to 1 amp. And we want that to be 25 millivolts. And we see the 25 millivolts by looking at the voltage on here at 1 amp. Okay, that's a little higher. Okay, now I'm at minimum. We trigger, okay. I'm going to set it higher. We're at 1 amp on the input. We want it just to not trigger. Something we have to do, we have to make sure we have enough current through the circuit uh, to, to get the voltage that we need. If, if this resistor is too large, then we're not going to have enough current. So we have to set the top end first. We'll go ahead and we'll set that near 3 volts, because they, they interact a little bit. But we'll set this one first. So I want that to be 3 volts. Okay, I'm going to crank it up. So I'm going to adjust this one here. I've got a, a potentiometer in there. And I'm going to adjust that up to 3 volts. I'm using the uh, scope voltage measuring. Okay, it's reading right at 300 millivolts times 10 is 3 volts. Okay, now I'm going to come back down. Okay, now we're not triggering. So I'm going to lower this one here, lower this resistor until we just trigger. This, the circuit is active. We have the peaks just below the set point. I'm going to take the set point, I'm going to lower it down until it just drops out. So now, I'm going to go below 1 amp, I'm going to go to 0.9 amps. Okay, that's 0.9 amps, I'll reset it. Okay, now I'm going to bring the current up to 1 amp and see if it triggers. Right at 1 amp. Okay. Now, I'm going to set it to 1 volt, and we should trigger at 5 amps. Okay, I'm going to go and set it, and that's at 1 volt. The, the voltage on the wiper is set to 1 volt, which would be for 5 amps. I'm going to bring the current up now to 5 amps, and we'll see if it triggers. Okay, we're right at 5. See where it goes. Okay, 5.3, so we're a little high. Okay, I'm going to set it down just a little bit. Okay, about 5.1 to 5.2, that's close enough. Okay, now I'm going to set it up to 2 volts, and that should be 10 amps. That's the limits of my variac here. Um, I don't want to go past 10 amps on the variac. It's a 10 amp variac, and I don't want to risk burning up the brush on my variac. 
Okay, I'm going to set it to 2 volts. Okay, about 11 amps. Okay, we're going to leave it right there. So it, it triggers, when we're set there, it said 11 amps. It's okay. We'll, when we calibrate this, we'll go ahead and we'll set it to read correctly. So that's how you go ahead and set these two resistors. As you measure your peak voltage at 5 amps, and then go ahead and um, set this voltage using these resistors to where at 5 amps you have the right voltage. And then go down to 0 or 1 amp, whatever you want your minimum to be, and set this one. Go to 15 amps and set this one. And um, it should be a fairly linear uh, change. Alright, let's go ahead and see what these resistors are. Okay, we're reading 8K. 400K. So, the upper resistor is going to be 400K and the lower one is going to be 8K. So we'll find an 8.2K and a 390K. <coughs> okay, now, the unit is completely finished electronic wise and mechanically so okay so the next thing we got to do we got to make our scale I'm going to glue a piece of paper on there and then we'll read the current and we'll mark it on there and then we'll make the scale on the computer and glue it on there. okay let's go to 2 amps okay I'm going to set it above 2 amps activate it now I'm going to bring it down until it just trips okay Okay, now I'm going to set it to 3 amps. Okay. Okay, here's the finished unit. Um, Alright, let's, let's go ahead and um, demonstrate how it works. Okay, now I'm going to plug it in. I got it set to um, 13 amps. Okay. Now, this is a 10 ohm load resistor, so we should not trip. Okay, we go on to it. See, and we're reading 9.8 amps. Okay, that's 120 volts at um, 10 amps going through it. Now, if I set it to 10 amps, it should pop because we're just above the 10 amps. See, and it shuts off immediately. So um, we can set it to whatever current we want and it goes ahead and protects us. Okay? Now, if we <clears throat> if we short it out directly, have a big bang, but it instantly shuts off. And if we set it to lower current, same thing happens. Electroboom would be proud of me. <laughs> okay, so that protects our um, that protects our circuitry. You get a pretty good bang out of it because we have um, two cycles there of full 120 volt, whatever the line can put through before it shuts off. And uh, I've measured it before. The short circuit current on my line in my lab is over 100 amps. That's where my um, my big amp meter uh, shuts off. So a dead short in this room is 100 amps for about three-tenths of a second before the main housebreaker blows. But this goes ahead and protects our line so that we can't blow the main housebreaker. And we also, we don't run 100 amps um, for any length of time through our, uh, through our wiring. Okay, so that's how the thing works. And uh, it will protect all your uh, electronics. You get that, that initial surge when it pops, but uh, it's a heck of a lot better than just having it sit there and fry until you uh, yank the cord out of the line or whatever. Okay, uh, now I've got the schematic coming up. <clears throat> Just use the screen capture and then print it off.